Hello and welcome to the Short Story Workshop. My name is Matt Bowles. I'm here with Melody Bowles and Simone King. Today we are going to be talking about The Little Mermaid by Hans Christian Andersen. So Simone, you pick this story. Please introduce us. So most people know that I have an interest in fairy tales and this one is one of my favourites. I think it's a really good story and a very classic one I think that a lot of people have heard of, but one that has a lot of interesting writing quirks and interpretations that can be brought to it, and a really interesting history, and I just really, really like it. Also, mermaids. So, hope you enjoy it. You can't go wrong. can't go wrong with mermaids. Here is The Little Mermaid by Hans Christian Andersen. Far out in the ocean, where the water is as blue as the prettiest cornflower and as clear as crystal, it is very, very deep, so deep, indeed, that no cable could sound it, and many church steeples, piled one upon another, would not reach from the ground beneath to the surface of the water above. There dwell the sea king and his subjects. We must not imagine that there is nothing at the bottom of the sea but bare yellow sand. No, indeed, for on this sand grow the strangest flowers and plants, the leaves and stems of which are so pliant that the slightest agitation of the water causes them to stir as if they had life. Fishes, both large and small, glide between the branches as birds fly among the trees here upon land. In the deepest spot of all stands the castle of the Sea King. Its walls are built of coral, and the long Gothic windows are of the clearest amber. The roof is formed of shells that open and close as the water flows over them. Their appearance is very beautiful, for in each lies a glittering pearl which would be fit for the diadem of a queen. The Sea King had been a widower for many years, and his aged mother kept house for him. She was a very sensible woman, but exceedingly proud of her high birth, and on that account were twelve oysters on her tail, while others of high rank were only allowed to wear six. She was, however, deserving of very great praise, especially for her care of the little sea princesses, her six granddaughters. They were beautiful children, but the youngest was the prettiest of them all. Her skin was as clear and delicate as a rose leaf, and her eyes as blue as the deepest sea, but like all the others, she had no feet, and her body ended in a fish's tail. All day long they played in the great halls of the castle, or among the living flowers that grew out of the walls. The large amber windows were open, and the fish swam in, just as the swallows fly into our houses when we open the windows. Only the fishes swam up to the princesses, ate out of their hands, and allowed themselves to be stroked. Outside the castle there was a beautiful garden in which grew bright red and dark blue flowers and blossoms like flames of fire. The fruit glittered like gold, and the leaves and stems waved to and fro continually. The earth itself was the finest sand, but blue as the flame of burning sulphur. Over everything lay a peculiar blue radiance, as if the blue sky were everywhere, above and below, instead of the dark depths of the sea. In calm weather the sun could be seen, looking like a reddish-purple flower, with light streaming from the calyx. Each of the young princesses had a little plot of ground in the garden, where she might dig and plant as she pleased. One arranged her flower bed in the form of a whale, another preferred to make hers like the figure of a little mermaid, while the youngest child made hers round, like the sun, and in it grew flowers as red as his rays at sunset. She was a strange child, quiet and thoughtful. While her sisters showed delight at the wonderful things which they obtained from the wrecks of vessels, she cared only for her pretty flowers, red like the sun, and a beautiful marble statue. It was the representation of a handsome boy, carved out of pure white stone, which had fallen from the bottom of the sea from a wreck. She planted by the statue a rose-coloured weeping willow. It grew rapidly, and soon hung its fresh branches over the statue, almost down to the blue sands. The shadows had the colour of violet, and waved to and fro like the branches, so that it seemed as if the crown of the tree and the root were at play, trying to kiss each other. Nothing gave her so much pleasure as to hear about the world above the sea. She made her old grandmother tell her all she knew of the ships, and of the towns, the people, and the animals. To her it seemed most wonderful and beautiful to hear that the flowers of the land had fragrance, while those below the sea had none, that the trees of the forest were green, and that the fishes among the trees could sing so sweetly that it was a pleasure to listen to them. Her grandmother called the birds fishes, or the little mermaid would not have understood what was meant, for she had never seen birds. "'When you have reached your fifteenth year,' said the grandmother, "'you will have permission to rise up out of the sea "'and sit on the rocks in the moonlight "'while the great ships go sailing by. "'Then you will see both forests and towns.' 
In the following year, one of the sisters would be 15, but as each was a year younger than the other, the youngest would have to wait five years before her turn came to rise up from the bottom of the ocean to see the earth as we do. However, each promised to tell the others what she saw on her first visit, and what she thought was most beautiful. Their grandmother could not tell them enough. There were so many things about which they wanted to know. None of them longed so much for her turn to come as the youngest, she who had the longest time to wait, and who was so quiet and thoughtful. Many nights she stood by the open window, looking up through the dark blue water, and watching the fish as they splashed about with their fins and tails. She could see the moon and stars shining faintly, but through the water they looked larger than they do to our eyes. When something like a black cloud passed between her and them, she knew that it was either a whale swimming over her head, or a ship full of human beings, who never imagined that a pretty little mermaid was standing beneath them, holding out her white hands towards the keel of their ship. At length, the eldest was fifteen, and was allowed to rise to the surface of the ocean. When she returned, she had hundreds of things to talk about, but the finest thing, she said, was to lie on a sandbank, in the quiet moonlit sea, near the shore, gazing at the lights of the nearby town, that twinkled like hundreds of stars, and listening to the sounds of music, the noise of carriages, the voices of human beings, and the merry pealing of the bells in the church steeples. Because she could not go near all these wonderful things, she longed for them all the more. Oh, how eagerly did the younger sister listen to all these descriptions! And afterwards, when she stood at the open window looking up through the dark blue water, she thought of the great city, with all its bustle and noise, and even fancied she could hear the sound of the church bells down in the depths of the sea. In another year, the second sister received permission to rise to the surface of the water, and to swim about where she pleased. She rose just as the sun was setting, and this, she said, was the most beautiful sight of all. The whole sky looked like gold, and violet and rose-coloured clouds, which she could not describe, drifted across it. And more swiftly than the clouds flew a large flock of wild swans towards the setting sun, like a long white veil across the sea. She also swam towards the sun, but it sank into the waves, and the rosy tints faded from the clouds and from the sea. The third sister's turn followed, and she was the boldest of them all, for she swam up a broad river that emptied into the sea. On the banks she saw green hills covered with beautiful vines, and palaces and castles peeping out from amid the proud trees of the forest. She heard birds singing, and felt the rays of the sun so strongly that she was obliged often to dive under the water to cool her burning face. In a narrow creek she found a large group of little human children, almost naked, sporting about in the water. She wanted to play with them, but they fled in a great fright, and then a little black animal. It was a dog, but she did not know, for she had never seen one before came to the water and barked at her so furiously that she became frightened and rushed back to the open sea. But she said she should never forget the beautiful forest, the green hills, and the pretty children who could swim in the water, although they had no tails. The fourth sister was more timid. She remained in the midst of the sea, but said it was quite as beautiful there as nearer the land. She could see many miles around her, and the sky above looked like a bell of glass. She had seen the ships, but at such a great distance that they looked like seagulls, the dolphins sported in the waves, and the great whales spouted water from their nostrils, till it seemed as if a hundred fountains were playing in every direction. The fifth sister's birthday occurred in the winter, so when her turn came she saw what the others had not seen the first time they went up. The sea looked quite green, and large icebergs were floating about, each like a pearl, she said, but larger and loftier than the churches built by men. They were of the most singular shapes, and glittered like diamonds. She had seated herself on one of the largest, and let the wind play with her long hair. She noticed that all the ships sailed past very rapidly, steering as far away as they could, as if they were afraid of the iceberg. Towards evening, as the sun went down, dark clouds covered the sky, the thunder rolled, and the flashes of lightning glowed red on the icebergs as they were tossed about by the heaving sea. On all the ships the sails were reefed with fear and trembling, while she sat on the floating iceberg, calmly watching the lightning as it darted its forked flashes into the sea. Each of the sisters, when first she had permission to rise to the surface, was delighted with the new and beautiful sights. Now that they were grown-up girls and could go when they pleased, they had become quite indifferent about it. They soon wished themselves back again, and after a month had passed, they said it was much more beautiful down below, and pleasanter to be at home. Yet often, in the evening hours, the five sisters would twine their arms about each other, and rise to the surface together. Their voices were more charming than that of any human being, and before the approach of a storm, when they feared that a ship might be lost, they swam before the vessel, singing enchanting songs of the delights to be found in the depths of the sea, and begging the voyagers not to fear if they sank to the bottom. But the sailors could not understand the song, and thought it was the sighing of the storm. 
these things were never beautiful to them, for if the ship sank, the men were drowned, and their dead bodies alone reached the palace of the Sea King. When the sisters rose, arm in arm through the water, their youngest sister would stand quite alone, looking after them, ready to cry, only, since mermaids have no tears, she suffered more acutely. "'Oh, were I but fifteen years old,' said she, "'I know that I shall love the world up there, and all the people who live in it.' At last she reached her fifteenth year. "'Well, now you are grown up,' said the old dowager, her grandmother. "'Come, and let me adorn you like your sisters.' And she placed in her hair a wreath of white lilies, of which every flower leaf was half a pearl. Then the old lady ordered eight great oysters to attach themselves to the tail of the princess to show her high rank. "'But they hurt me so,' said the little mermaid. "'Yes, I know. Pride must suffer pain,' replied the old lady. Oh, how gladly she would have shaken off all this grandeur and laid aside the heavy wreath. The red flowers in her own garden would have suited her much better. But she could not change herself, so she said farewell and rose as lightly as a bubble to the surface of the water. The sun had just set when she raised her head above the waves. The clouds were tinted with crimson and gold, and through the glimmering twilight beamed the evening star in all its beauty. The sea was calm, and the air mild and fresh. A large ship with three masts lay becalmed on the water. Only one sail was set, for not a breeze stirred, and the sailors sat idle on deck or amidst the rigging. There was music and song on board, and as darkness came on, a hundred coloured lanterns were lighted, as if the flags of all nations waved in the air. The little mermaid swam close to the cabin windows, and now and then, as the waves lifted her up, she could look in through glass window panes and see a number of gaily dressed people. Among them, and the most beautiful of all, was a young prince with large black eyes. He was sixteen years of age, and his birthday was being celebrated with great display. The sailors were dancing on deck, and when the prince came out of the cabin, more than a hundred rockets rose in the air, making it as bright as day. The little mermaid was so startled that she dived under water, and when she again stretched out her head, it looked as if all the stars of heaven were falling around her. She had never seen such fireworks before. Great suns spurted fire about. Splendid fireflies flew into the blue air, and everything was reflected in the clear, calm sea beneath. The ship itself was so brightly illuminated that all the people, and even the smallest rope, could be distinctly seen. How handsome the young prince looked, as he pressed the hands of all his guests and smiled at them, while the music resounded through the clear night air. It was very late, yet the little mermaid could not take her eyes from the ship or from the beautiful prince. The coloured lanterns had been extinguished, no more rockets rose in the air, and the cannon had ceased firing, but the sea became restless, and a moaning, grumbling sound could be heard beneath the waves. Still, the little mermaid remained by the cabin window, rocking up and down on the water, so that she could look within. After a while, the sails were quickly set, and the ship went on her way, but soon the waves rose higher, heavy clouds darkened the sky, and lightning appeared in the distance. A dreadful storm was approaching. Once more the sails were furled, and the great ship pursued her flying course over the raging sea. The waves rose mountain high, as if they would overtop the mast, but the ship dived like a swan between them, then rose again on their lofty foaming crests. To the little mermaid this was pleasant sport, but not so to the sailors. At length the ship groaned and creaked, the thick planks gave way under the lashing of the sea, as the waves broke over the deck, the mainmast snapped asunder like a reed, and as the ship lay over on her side, the water rushed in. The little mermaid now perceived that the crew were in danger. Even she was obliged to be careful, to avoid the beams and planks of the wreck which lay scattered on the water. At one moment it was pitch dark, so that she could not see a single object, but when a flash of lightning came, it revealed the whole scene. She could see everyone who had been on board except the prince. When the ship parted, she had seen him sink into the deep waves, and she was glad, for she thought he would now be with her. Then she remembered that human beings could not live in the water, so that when he got down to her father's palace he would certainly be quite dead. No, he must not die! So she swam about among the beams and planks, which strewed the surface of the sea, forgetting that they could crush her to pieces. Diving deep under the dark waters, rising and falling with the waves, she at length managed to reach the young prince, who was fast losing the power to swim in that stormy sea. His limbs were failing him, his beautiful eyes were closed, and he would have died had not the little mermaid come to his assistance. She held his head above the water, and let the waves carry them where they would. In the morning the storm had ceased, but of the ship not a single fragment could be seen. The sun came up red and shining out of the water, and its beams brought back the hue of health to the prince's cheeks, but his eyes remained closed. 
The mermaid kissed his high, smooth forehead and stroked back his wet hair. He seemed to her like the marble statue in her little garden, so she kissed him again and wished that he might live. Presently they came in sight of land, and she saw lofty blue mountains on which the white snow rested, as if a flock of swans were lying upon them. Beautiful green forests were near the shore, and close by stood a large building, whether a church or a convent she could not tell. Orange and citron trees grew in the garden, and before the door stood lofty palms. The sea here formed a little bay, in which the water lay quiet and still, but very deep. She swam with the handsome prince to the beach, which was covered with fine white sand, and there she laid him in the warm sunshine, taking care to raise his head higher than his body. Then bells sounded in the large white building, and some young girls came into the garden. The little mermaid swam out farther from the shore and hid herself among some high rocks that rose out of the water. Covering her head and neck with the foam of the sea, she watched there to see what would become of the poor prince. It was not long before she saw a young girl approach the spot where the prince lay. She seemed frightened at first, but only for a moment. Then she brought a number of people, and the mermaid saw that the prince came to life again, and smiled upon those who stood about him. But to her he sent no smile. He knew not that she had saved him. This made her very sorrowful, and when he was led away into the great building, she dived down into the water and returned to her father's castle. She had always been silent and thoughtful, and now she was more so than ever. Her sisters asked her what she had seen during her first visit to the surface of the water, but she could tell them nothing. Many an evening and morning did she rise to the place where she had left the prince. She saw the fruits in the garden ripen, and watched them gathered. She watched the snow on the mountain tops melt away, but never did she see the prince, and therefore she always returned home more sorrowful than before. It was her only comfort to sit in her own little garden, and fling her arm around the beautiful marble statue, which was like the prince. She gave up tending her flowers, and they grew in wild confusion over the paths, twining their long leaves and stems round the branches of the trees, so that the whole place became dark and gloomy. At length she could bear it no longer, and told one of her sisters all about it. Then the others heard the secret, and very soon it became known to several mermaids, one of whom had an intimate friend, who happened to know about the prince. She had also seen the festival on board ship, and she told them where the prince came from, and where his palace stood. "'Come, little sister,' said the other princesses. Then they entwined their arms and rose together to the surface of the water, near the spot where they knew the prince's palace stood. It was built of bright yellow shining stone, and had long flights of marble steps, one of which reached quite down to the sea. Splendid gilded cupolas rose over the roof, and between the pillars that surrounded the whole building stood lifelike statues of marble. Through the clear crystal of the lofty windows could be seen noble rooms, with costly silk curtains and hangings of tapestry and walls covered with beautiful paintings. In the centre of the largest salon, a fountain threw its sparkling jets high up into the glass cupola of the ceiling, through which the sun shone in upon the water, and upon the beautiful plants that grew in the basin of the fountain. Now that the little mermaid knew where the prince lived, she spent many an evening and many a night on the water near the palace. She would swim much nearer the shore than any of the others had ventured, and once she went up the narrow channel under the marble balcony, which threw a broad shadow on the water. Here she sat and watched the young prince, who thought himself alone in the bright moonlight. She often saw him evenings, sailing in a beautiful boat on which music sounded and flags waved. She peeped out from among the green rushes, and if the wind caught her long silvery white veil, those who saw it believed it to be a swan, spreading out its wings. Many a night, too, when the fishermen set their nets by the light of their torches, she heard them relate many good things about the young prince, and this made her glad that she had saved his life when he was tossed about half dead on the waves. She remembered how his head had rested on her bosom, and how heartily she had kissed him, but he knew nothing of all this, and could not even dream of her. She grew more and more to like human beings, and wished more and more to be able to wander about with those whose world seemed to be so much larger than her own. They could fly over the sea in ships, and mount the high hills which were far above the clouds, and the lands they possessed, their woods and their fields, stretched far away beyond the reach of her sight. There was so much that she wished to know, but her sisters were unable to answer all her questions. She then went to her old grandmother, who knew all about the upper world, which she rightly called, The Lands Above the Sea. "'If human beings are not drowned,' asked the little mermaid, "'can they live forever? Do they never die, as we do here in the sea?' Yes, replied the old lady. They must also die, and their term of life is even shorter than ours. We sometimes live for three hundred years, but when we cease to exist here, we become only foam on the surface of the water, and have not even a grave among those we love. We have not immortal souls. We shall never live again. 
Like the green seaweed, when once it had been cut off, we can never flourish more. Human beings, on the contrary, have souls which live forever, even after the body has been turned to dust. They rise up through the clear, pure air, beyond the glittering stars. As we rise out of the water and behold all the land of the earth, so do they rise to unknown and glorious regions which we shall never see. Why have we not immortal souls? asked the little mermaid mournfully. I would gladly give all the hundreds of years that I have to live to be a human being only for one day, and have the hope of knowing the happiness of that glorious world above the stars. You must not think that, said the old woman. We believe that we are much happier and much better off than human beings. So I shall die, said the little mermaid, and as the foam of the sea I shall be driven about, never again to hear the music of the waves, or to see the pretty flowers of the red sun. Is there anything I can do to win an immortal soul? No, said the old woman, unless a man should love you so much that you are more to him than his father or his mother, and if all his thoughts and all his love were fixed upon you, and the priest placed his right hand in yours, and he promised to be true to you here and hereafter, then his soul would glide into your body, and you would obtain a share in the future happiness of mankind. He would give to you a soul, and retain his own as well, but this can never happen. Your fish's tail, which among us is considered so beautiful, on earth is thought to be quite ugly. They do not know any better, and they think it necessary, in order to be handsome, to have two stout props, which they call legs. Then the little mermaid sighed, and looked sorrowfully at her fish's tail. Let us be happy, said the old lady, and dart and spring about during the three hundred years that we have to live, which is really quite long enough. After that, we can rest ourselves all the better. This evening we are going to have a court ball. It was one of those splendid sights which we can never see on earth. The walls and the ceiling of the large ballroom were of thick but transparent crystal. Many hundreds of colossal shells, some of a deep red, others of a grass green, with blue fire in them stood in rows on each side. These lighted up the whole salon and shone through the walls so that the sea was also illuminated. Innumerable fishes, great and small, swam past the crystal walls. On some of them the scales glowed with a purple brilliance, and on others shone like silver and gold. Through the halls flowed a broad stream, and in it danced the mermen and the mermaids to the music of their own sweet singing. No one on earth has such lovely voices as they, but the little mermaid sang more sweetly than all. The whole court applauded her with hands and tails, and for a moment her heart felt quite gay, for she knew she had the sweetest voice either on earth or in the sea. But soon she thought again of the world above her. She could not forget the charming prince, nor her sorrow that she had not an immortal soul like his. She crept away silently, out of her father's palace, and while everything within was gladness and song, she sat in her own little garden, sorrowful and alone. Then she heard the bugle sounding through the water, and thought, He is certainly sailing above, he in whom my wishes centre, and in whose hands I should like to place the happiness of my life. I will venture all for him, and to win an immortal soul, while my sisters are dancing in my father's palace, I will go to the sea witch, of whom I have always been so much afraid, she can give me counsel and help. Then the little mermaid went out from her garden and took the road to the foaming whirlpools behind which the sorceress lived. She had never been that way before. Neither flowers nor grass grew there, nothing but bare, grey, sandy ground stretched out to the whirlpool, where the water, like foaming mill wheels, seized everything that came within its reach and cast it into the fathomless deep. Through the midst of these crushing whirlpools, the little mermaid was obliged to pass before she could reach the dominions of the sea witch. Then, for a long distance, the road lay across a stretch of warm, bubbling mire, called by the witch her turf moor. Beyond this was the witch's house, which stood in the centre of a strange forest, where all the trees and flowers were polypi, half animals and half plants. They looked like serpents with a hundred heads, growing out of the ground. The branches were long, slimy arms, with fingers like flexible worms, moving limb after limb from the root to the top. All that could be reached in the sea they seized upon and held fast, so that it never escaped from their clutches. The little mermaid was so alarmed at what she saw that she stood still, and her heart beat with fear. She came very near turning back, but she thought of the prince and of the human soul for which she longed, and her courage returned. She fastened her long flowing hair round her head, so that the polypi should not lay hold of it. She crossed her hands on her bosom and then darted forward as a fish shoots through the water between the supple arms and fingers of the ugly polypi, which were stretched out on each side of her. She saw that they all held in their grasp something they had seized with their numerous little arms, which were as strong as iron bands. 
tightly grasped in their clinging arms were white skeletons of human beings who had perished at sea and had sunk down into the deep waters skeletons of land animals and oars rudders and chests of ships there was even a little mermaid whom they had caught and strangled and this seemed the most shocking of all to the little princess she now came to a space of marshy ground in the wood where large fat water snakes were rolling in the mire and showing their ugly drab-coloured bodies in the midst of this spot stood a house built of the bones of shipwrecked human beings there sat the sea witch allowing a toad to eat from her mouth just as people sometimes feed a canary with pieces of sugar she called the ugly water snakes her little chickens and allowed them to crawl all over her bosom i know what you want said the sea witch it is very stupid of you but you shall have your way though it will bring you to sorrow my pretty princess you want to get rid of your fish's tail and have two supports instead like human beings on earth so that the young prince may fall in love with you and so that you may have an immortal soul and then the witch laughed so loud and so disgustingly that the toad and the snakes fell to the ground and lay there wriggling you are but just in time said the witch for after sunrise to-morrow i should not be able to help you till the end of another year i will prepare a draught for you with which you must swim to land to-morrow before sunrise seat yourself there and drink it your tail will then disappear and shrink up into what men call legs you will feel great pain as if a sword were passing through you but all who see you will say that you are the prettiest little human being they ever saw you will still have the same floating gracefulness of movement and no dancer will ever tread so lightly every step you take however will be as if you were treading upon sharp knives and as if the blood must flow if you will bear all this i will help you yes i will said the little princess in a trembling voice as she thought of the prince and the immortal soul but think again said the witch for when once your shape has become like a human being you can no more be a mermaid you will never return through the water to your sisters or to your father's palace again and if you do not win the love of the prince so that he is willing to forget his father and mother for your sake to love you with his whole soul and allow the priest to join your hands that you may be man and wife then you will never have an immortal soul the first morning after he marries another your heart will break and you will become foam on the crest of the waves i will do it said the little mermaid and she became pale as death but i must be paid also said the witch and it is not a trifle that i ask you have the sweetest voice of any who dwell here in the depths of the sea and you believe that you will be able to charm the prince with it but this voice you must give to me the best thing you possess will i have as the price of my costly draught which must be mixed with my own blood so that it may be as sharp as a two-edged sword but if you take away my voice said the little mermaid what is left for me your beautiful form your graceful walk and your expressive eyes surely with those you can enchain a man's heart well have you lost your courage put out your little tongue that i may cut it off as my payment then she shall have the powerful draught it shall be said the little mermaid then the witch placed her cauldron on the fire to prepare the magic draught cleanliness is a good thing said she scouring the vessel with snakes which she had tied together in a large knot then she pricked herself in the breast and let the black blood drop into the cauldron the steam that rose twisted itself into such horrible shapes that no one could look at them without fear every moment the witch threw a new ingredient into the vessel and when it began to boil the sound was like the weeping of a crocodile when at last the magic draught was ready it looked like the clearest water there it is for you said the witch then she cut off the mermaid's tongue so that she would never again speak or sing if the polypi should seize you as you return through the wood said the witch throw over them a few drops of the potion and their fingers will be torn into a thousand pieces but the little mermaid had no occasion to do this for the polypi sprang back in terror when they caught sight of the glittering draught which shone in her hand like a twinkling star so she passed quickly through the wood and the marsh and between the rushing whirlpools she saw that in her father's palace the torches in the ballroom were extinguished and that all within were asleep but she did not venture to go into them for now that she was dumb and going to leave them forever she felt as if her heart would break she stole into the garden took a flower from the flower bed of each of her sisters kissed her hand towards the palace a thousand times and then rose up through the dark blue waters the sun had not risen when she came in sight of the prince's palace and approached the beautiful marble steps but the moon shone clear and bright then the little mermaid drank the magic draught and it seemed as if a two-edged sword went through her delicate body she fell into a swoon and lay like one dead when the sun rose and shone over the sea she recovered and felt a sharp pain but before her stood the handsome young prince he fixed his coal black eyes upon her so earnestly that she cast down her own and then became aware that her fish's tail was gone 
and that she had as pretty a pair of white legs and tiny feet as any little maiden could have, but she had no clothes, so she wrapped herself in her long thick hair. The prince asked her who she was and whence she came. She looked at him mildly and sorrowfully with her deep blue eyes, but could not speak. He took her by the hand and led her to the palace. Every step she took was as the witch had said it would be. She felt as if she were treading upon the points of needles or sharp knives. She bore it willingly, however, and moved at the prince's side as lightly as a bubble, so that he and all who saw her wondered at her graceful swaying movements. She was very soon arrayed in costly robes of silk and muslin, and was the most beautiful creature in the palace. But she was dumb, and could neither speak nor sing. Beautiful female slaves, dressed in silk and gold, stepped forward and sang before the prince and his royal parents. One sang better than all the others, and the prince clapped his hands and smiled at her. This was a great sorrow to the little mermaid, for she knew how much more sweetly she herself once could sing, and she thought, Oh, if he could only know that I have given away my voice forever to be with him. The slaves next performed some pretty fairy-like dances to the sound of beautiful music. Then the little mermaid raised her lovely white arms, stood on the tips of her toes, glided over the floor, and danced as no one yet had been able to dance. At each moment her beauty was more revealed, and her expressive eyes appealed more directly to the heart than the songs of the slaves. Every one was enchanted, especially the prince, who called her his little foundling. She danced again quite readily to please him, though each time her foot touched the floor it seemed as if she trod on sharp knives. The prince said she should remain with him always, and she was given permission to sleep at his door on a velvet cushion. He had a page's dress made for her, that she might accompany him on horseback. They rode together through the sweet-scented woods, where the green boughs touched their shoulders, and the little birds sang among the fresh leaves. She climbed with him to the tops of high mountains, and although her tender feet bled so that even her steps were marked, she only smiled and followed him till they could see the clouds beneath them, like a flock of birds flying to distant lands. While at the prince's palace, and when all the household were asleep, she would go and sit on the broad marble steps, for it eased her burning feet to bathe them in the cold sea water. It was then that she thought of all those below in the deep. Once during the night her sisters came up arm in arm, singing sorrowfully as they floated on the water. She beckoned to them, and they recognised her, and told her how she had grieved them. After that they came to the same place every night. Once she saw in the distance her old grandmother, who had not been to the surface of the sea for many years, and the old sea-king, her father, with his crown on his head. They stretched out their hands towards her, but did not venture so near the land as her sisters had. As the days passed she loved the prince more dearly, and he loved her as one would love a little child. The thought never came to him to make her his wife, yet unless he married her she could not receive an immortal soul, and on the morning after his marriage with another she would dissolve into the foam of the sea. "'Do you not love me the best of them all?' the eyes of the little mermaid seemed to say when he took her in his arms and kissed her fair forehead. "'Yes, you are dear to me,' said the prince, "'for you have the best heart, and you are the most devoted to me. "'You are like a young maiden whom I once saw, but whom I shall never meet again. "'I was in a ship that was wrecked, and the waves cast me ashore near a holy temple, "'where several young maidens performed the service. "'The youngest of them found me on the shore and saved my life. "'I saw her but twice, and she is the only one in the world whom I could love. "'But you are like her, and you have almost driven her image from my mind. "'She belongs to the holy temple.' and good fortune has sent you to me in her stead. We will never part. Ah, he knows not that it was I who saved his life, thought the little mermaid. I carried him over the sea to the wood where the temple stands. I sat beneath the foam and watched till the human beings came to help him. I saw the pretty maiden that he loves better than he loves me. The mermaid sighed deeply, but she could not weep. He says the maiden belongs to the holy temple, therefore she will never return to the world. They will meet no more. I am by his side and see him every day. I will take care of him, and love him, and give up my life for his sake. Very soon it was said that the prince was to marry, and that the beautiful daughter of a neighbouring king would be his wife, for a fine ship was being fitted out. Although the prince gave out that he intended merely to pay a visit to the king, it was generally supposed that he went to court the princess. A great company were to go with him. The little mermaid smiled and shook her head. She knew the prince's thoughts better than any of the others. I must travel, he said to her. I must see this beautiful princess. My parents desire it, but they will not oblige me to bring her home as my bride. I cannot love her, because she is not like the beautiful maiden in the temple whom you resemble. If I were forced to choose a bride, I would choose you, my dumb foundling, with those expressive eyes. Then he kissed her rosy mouth, played with her long waving hair, and laid his head on her heart, while she dreamed of human happiness and an immortal soul. You 
are not afraid of the sea, my dumb child, are you? he said, as they stood on the deck of a noble ship which was to carry them to the country of the neighbouring king. Then he told her of storm and of calm, of strange fishes in the deep beneath them, and of what the divers had seen there. She smiled at his descriptions, for she knew better than anyone what wonders were at the bottom of the sea. In the moonlight night, when all on board were asleep except the man at the helm, she sat on deck, gazing down through the clear water. She thought she could distinguish her father's castle, and upon it her aged grandmother, with a silver crown on her head, looking through the rushing tide at the keel of the vessel. Then her sisters came up on the waves, and gazed at her mournfully, wringing their white hands. She beckoned to them, and smiled, and wanted to tell them how happy and well off she was. But the cabin boy approached, and when her sisters dived down, he thought what he saw was only the foam of the sea. The next morning the ship sailed into the harbour of a beautiful town, belonging to the king whom the prince was going to visit. The church bells were ringing, and from the high towers sounded a flourish of trumpets. Soldiers, with flying colours and glittering bayonets, lined the roads through which they passed. Every day was a festival, balls and entertainments following one another, but the princess had not yet appeared. People said that she had been brought up and educated in a religious house, where she was learning every royal virtue. At last she came. Then the little mermaid, who was anxious to see whether she was really beautiful, was obliged to admit that she had never seen a more perfect vision of beauty. Her skin was delicately fair, beneath her long dark eyelashes her laughing blue eyes shone with truth and purity. "'It was you,' said the prince, "'who saved my life when I lay as if dead on the beach,' and he folded his blushing bride in his arms. "'Oh, I am too happy,' said he to the little mermaid. "'My fondest hopes are now fulfilled. You will rejoice at my happiness, for your devotion to me is great and sincere.' The little mermaid kissed his hand, and felt as if her heart were already broken. His wedding morning would bring death to her, and she would change into the foam of the sea. All the church bells rang, and the heralds rode through the town, proclaiming the betrothal. Perfumed oil was burned in costly silver lamps on every altar. The priests waved the censers, while the bride and the bridegroom joined their hands and received the blessing of the bishop. The little mermaid, dressed in silk and gold, held up the bride's train, but her ears heard nothing of the festive music, and her eyes saw not the holy ceremony. She thought of the night of death which was coming to her, and of all she had lost in the world. On the same evening the bride and bridegroom went on board the ship. Cannons were roaring, flags waving, and in the centre of the ship a costly tent of purple and gold had been erected. It contained elegant sleeping couches for the bridal pair during the night. The ship, under a favourable wind, with swelling sails, glided away smoothly and lightly over the calm sea. When it grew dark, a number of coloured lamps were lighted, and the sailors danced merrily on the deck. The little mermaid could not help thinking of her first rising out of the sea, when she had seen similar joyful festivities. So she too joined in the dance, poised herself in the air as a swallow when he pursues his prey, and all present cheered her wonderingly. She had never danced so gracefully before. Her tender feet felt as if cut with sharp knives, but she cared not for the pain. A sharper pang had pierced her heart. She knew this was the last evening she should ever see the prince, for whom she had forsaken her kindred and her home. She had given up her beautiful voice, and suffered unheard of pain daily for him, while he knew nothing of it. This was the last evening that she should breathe the same air with him, or gaze on the starry sky and the deep sea. An eternal night, without a thought or a dream, awaited her. She had no soul, and now could never win one. All was joy and gaiety on the ship, until long after midnight. She smiled and danced with the rest, while the thought of death was in her heart. The prince kissed his beautiful bride, and she played with his raven hair till they went arm in arm to rest in the sumptuous tent. Then all became still on board the ship, and only the pilot, who stood at the helm, was awake. The little mermaid leaned her white arms on the edge of the vessel, and looked towards the east for the first blush of morning, for that first ray of the dawn which was to be her death. She saw her sisters rising out of the flood. They were as pale as she, but their beautiful hair no longer waved in the wind. It had been cut off. "'We have given our hair to the witch,' said they, "'to obtain help for you. She may not die tonight. She has given us a knife.' See, it is very sharp. Before the sun rises, you must plunge it into the heart of the prince. When the warm blood falls upon your feet, they will grow together again into a fish's tail, and you will once more be a mermaid, and can return to us to live out your three hundred years before you are changed into the salt sea foam. Haste, then. Either he or you must die before sunrise. Our old grandmother mourns so for you that her white hair is falling, as ours fell under the witch's scissors. Kill the prince and come back. Hasten. 
do you not see the first red streaks in the sky in a few minutes the sun will rise and you must die then they sighed deeply and mournfully and sank beneath the waves the little mermaid drew back the crimson curtain of the tent and beheld the fair bride whose head was resting on the prince's breast she bent down and kissed his noble brow then looked at the sky on which the rosy dawn grew brighter and brighter she glanced at the sharp knife and again fixed her eyes on the prince who whispered the name of his bride in his dreams she was in his thoughts and the knife trembled in the hand of the little mermaid but she flung it far from her into the waves the water turned red where it fell and the drops that spurted up looked like blood she cast one more lingering half fainting glance at the prince then threw herself from the ship into the sea and felt her body dissolving into foam the sun rose above the waves and his warm rays fell on the cold foam of the little mermaid who did not feel as if she were dying she saw the bright sun and hundreds of transparent beautiful creatures floating around her she could see through them the white sails of the ships and the red clouds in the sky their speech was melodious but could not be heard by mortal ears just as their bodies could not be seen by mortal eyes the little mermaid perceived that she had a body like theirs and that she continued to rise higher and higher out of the foam where am i asked she and her voice sounded ethereal like the voices of those who were with her no earthly music could imitate it among the daughters of the air answered one of them a mermaid has not an immortal soul nor can she obtain one unless she wins the love of a human being on the will of another hangs her eternal destiny but the daughters of the air although they do not possess an immortal soul can by their good deeds procure one for themselves we fly to warm countries and cool the sultry air that destroys mankind with the pestilence we carry the perfume of the flowers to spread health and restoration after we have striven for three hundred years to do all the good in our power we receive an immortal soul and take part in the happiness of mankind you poor little mermaid have tried with your whole heart to do as we are doing you have suffered and endured and raised yourself to the spirit world by your good deeds and now by striving for three hundred years in the same way you may obtain an immortal soul the little mermaid lifted her glorified eyes towards the sun and for the first time felt them filling with tears on the ship in which she had left the prince there were life and noise and she saw him and his beautiful bride searching for her sorrowfully they gazed at the pearly foam as if they knew she had thrown herself into the waves unseen she kissed the forehead of the bride and found the prince and then mounted with the other children of the air to a rosy cloud that floated above after three hundred years thus shall we float into the kingdom of heaven said she and we may even get there sooner whispered one of her companions unseen we can enter the houses of men where there are children and for every day on which we find a good child that is the joy of his parents and deserves their love our time of probation is shortened the child does not know when we fly through the room that we smile with joy at his good conduct for we can count one year less of our three hundred years but when we see a naughty or a wicked child we shed tears of sorrow and for every tear a day is added to our time of trial first impressions people mel what did you think i love the descriptions in this the underwater palace and the the shipwreck and all of the underwater environments the the witches place as well with all the creepy tentacle plants they were great yeah i i really like the descriptions as well in particular the way that it uses all these really bright colors it makes it really pretty and imaginative and just the little details about like the fish swimming in through the windows make it so much more real. It's really good. Her sisters have like their flower gardens. Yeah, there was a lot more sense of backstory and what the Little Mermaid's family was like, I think, in the original tale than perhaps the Disney version that people are more familiar with. You got far more of a sense of what the Little Mermaid was giving up to chase her prince than you would have, I think, in a, some other adaptations. There's a bit of a lead-in before she meets, saves the prince and makes her bargain, which talks about her sisters, her father and her grandmother, which I've never I've never seen much about them before. I think I had some vague awareness that she had some sisters from osmosis through other sources, but I yeah I didn't know how close they were and didn't really know what their relationship was like. So it was interesting to go back to the original tale. I'm coming at it slightly differently because I don't think I ever saw the Disney version. Have you lived under a rock? I mean, under a seashell, maybe. No, that's... <laughs> um, 
So in some ways, it's my first exposure to the, to the story. So I'm kind of seeing it from a different, slightly different perspective. But I did really like it. The descriptions, as mentioned, I thought the, the plot of the romance that doesn't quite work out was interesting. And that's something that's underrepresented. The ending, not so keen on, but we'll, we'll get to that. So that's the thing that brings it down for me. Everything else I really liked. She wants an immortal soul. I didn't know that that was going to be the drive of the story. I was, I thought the drive was going to be, I want to be with a prince, not I want an immortal soul. Hans Christian Andersen kind of sets up that motivation of the romance with the prince. And then he's like, but actually it's about the soul thing. And it, it seems a bit weird. I, I wonder if maybe that was something that was added later. As I say, maybe he wanted to add something after the romance didn't work out. I guess you need the romance element so that the plot has places to go, right? But if her whole motivation was just to get the immortal soul, then having this romance thing thrown in would seem a bit strange. So maybe that's why he did it this way around. Because if she was like, oh, I want an immortal soul, and she's like, oh, well, you must marry this prince. You'd be like, well, what if she doesn't want to marry the prince? Yeah, I like the story a lot. It's one of my favourite fairy tales that we've read. Yeah, it's a classic one for a reason, I think. So I found it really interesting that the main romance in this, if it could be called that, was one of unrequited love. I mean, to a certain extent, unrequited romantic love, I want to say, because it is made clear that the prince is actually very fond of The Little Mermaid, which I did really appreciate, because I think, especially in a lot of modern adaptations, there's always the stance of, well, the prince is just like a terrible person, and if you're in love with someone and they don't love you back, they're a terrible person, and they're just using you, or they never cared about you. Well, actually, I think unrequited love is a lot more complicated, and I rarely see that rep represented, that someone can be worthy of your love, even if they don't return the love in the same way that you love them. So I was curious about your thoughts on the unrequited love and the romance. I just like seeing a romance that doesn't work out because every time when you read it in a book they just get together and it's happily ever after and I hate it. You hate happy ever afters. <laughs> well, look, let's not be dramatic but I think we need more stories about romances that don't work out because there can be many reasons why it doesn't happen and people survive that and it's fine and they can. I think that can be just as informative about the real world, or maybe even more so than the stories where you actually have a romance that works. Like, don't get me wrong, I understand the fantasy behind having a romance and the couple get together. But also, particularly, I find in contemporary fiction, whenever there is an unrequited romance, it's often a girl for a guy, and then there's the idea that the guy will come around by the end, at which point she's already got someone who deserves her more because they loved her earlier. And the idea that just because you don't love someone in a romantic way or return their feelings inherently means that your relationship is somehow callous is not one I particularly appreciate because I think it adds very real implications to people in life. Like, it's why it can be so hard to turn down someone, for example, because there's this expectation that if love is true or someone is worth loving that they've got to return your feelings in the same way when I don't think that's true. In terms of this story, I thought the romance was really tragic and cruel in the fact that he thinks his new wife is the mermaid who saved him. Ouch, ouch, ouch. He treats her okay, but, like, he's a bit, I don't know... Condescending? Yeah, he's condescending. He treats her like a silly little sister because she can't talk, which made me like him less. That's the thing. I think the reason why these stories don't exist so much is because it's very difficult to do while making both characters in the relationship still sympathetic. Because if you like one of them more than the other, then this kind of situation makes you dislike the other one, right? True. But then I also think it gives a certain amount of power to her decision at the end. Like, the story wouldn't, come, wouldn't work if the prince loved her back. In all fairness, why would he love her back? Like, she's this random woman who he doesn't particularly know anything about. And no offence, but I'm not sure I want to marry someone I would never be able to have a conversation with. It's just sad. <laughs> it is sad, but I think there's a place for sad, tragic romances. And it's good to see a well-done one, because it's not a forced conflict. 
it's not them having some dumb misunderstanding and blowing up at each other. It's a very real, very genuine actual conflict because they just don't feel the same way about each other. He doesn't recognise her. That's the bit that gets me. He was unconscious and nearly drowned. I mean, she was the one who went and hid in the foam. She wanted credit. She should have stuck around and been like, hey, I saved you. Like, it's not solely on him. They did spend a fair amount of time together. At some point, she could have, you know, taken him to meet her sisters or who were clearly still invested in her fate. I was like, she should have written it in the sand. And then I was like, she's a mermaid. She probably doesn't know how to write. <laughs> yeah. She knew how to write. This whole situation would be like a thousand times easier. Which is, I mean, in my opinion, that's why when she was like, oh, by the way, I'm going to take your voice as well. She should have been like, uh, no, are you kidding me? The, the voice symbolism interests me. I think a lot of contemporary readings view it as a feminist thing of, you know, you shouldn't give up your voice for a man. From having read a little about Hans Christian Andersen and his experiences before writing the story of the Little Mermaid. So basically he was in love with this guy, quite aggressively and openly in love with him, sending him lots of love letters and the like until the guy got engaged with someone else. And was basically like, you're a worthy friend, but I don't feel that way about you. So in that sense, I think, to cycle back to the voice, when you're in unrequited love with someone, I think, or when you're repressing part of your identity or anything like that, I think it is easy to feel voiceless or that you can't express exactly what it is that you feel about someone, which I think the voicelessness really emphasises. It's less about necessarily i think a feminist reading of you need to give up your voice so much as a sometimes it's really difficult to express your feelings and having your voice taken away is a perfect metaphor for that feeling of like being helplessly and quietly in love with someone that's cool and all um i honestly think it's only or at least originally it was probably there just so it didn't break the part where he doesn't know that she saved him possibly but also I find it interesting for what it suggests about longing and yearning and our ability to communicate our feelings. Yeah. I thought it was about how much you'd be willing to give up to be with that one person. And if you really, really want to be with them, you sort of make so many, you used to keep making compromises until you, you might end up in a situation where you don't have any say over the relationship at all. That is also a valid interpretation I would probably agree with. Like, you can only give up so much without someone reciprocating, which I think is the other part where the unrequited love comes in. I mean, even if he did, like, return her feelings, it's a terrible deal. True, but it's got also awful. the sea witch wasn't... She didn't trick the Little Mermaid. She was very open about what the costs were. I can't view her as the villain to the piece because of that. Like, it's not even demon deal where it's like, yeah, I'll give you legs, but I'm not going to tell you that it's going to cause you pain forever. Like, he's very upfront. Yeah, and you know what? That's why it's the Little Mermaid's fault. I just watch her make this deal, and I'm like, are you crazy? Yes, and you've never been madly in love. How dare you? I'm also a logical and, and rational human being, and also I doubt her ability to be in love with someone who she has never had a conversation with. More of, I guess, the representation of everything human that she wants. It's just, it's it's just a terrible deal. You can't dispute that. I would agree, but I also think it was interesting how people are willing to twist it to not being one that the little mermaid made knowingly. Do you think she wanted the immortal soul or the prince more? I think the prince was a more immediate concern. I think that was a larger thing of being she wanted to be human. And then the soul was just like an added cherry on top. I was wondering if the deal would be more reasonable if it was for the immortal soul rather than the romance with the prince or legs or something else. I feel like an immortal soul should cost more than legs. <laughs> Every time you walk, you, it's painful and you've lost your only means of communication with any other person. No. Well, it's a good allegory, allegory for the trials of love, I guess. And the painfulness of being in love with someone who doesn't love you back. I'll try and become like them, but it will really, really hurt. <laughs> and I won't get a say over anything. Well, that is kind of what it's like, isn't it, though, when you try so hard to be like someone else? 
Like, it does hurt to not be your authentic self. Poor mermaid. Pats her. I like that she did make another conscious decision at the end, though. Like, it wasn't just that she made a dumb deal and couldn't have taken it back. She got the chance to take it back at the end, which is why I think that she wanted the prince more than the immortal soul. Well, it's not really the same, is it? Like, you can reverse the deal, but this guy has to die. I mean, one of them had to. One of them had to die. Like, she knew it was going to be either her or him. So I think it says a lot about her as a character that she chose herself over him. Yeah, but that's not reversing the deal. It's a different situation. I was going to say I would have found that quite unsatisfying if she just stabbed him and then that was the end. It's the idea, isn't it, that if you love someone, you're willing to, to a certain extent, put their happiness above your own. I think in this story, perhaps it's taken a little too far, but... I liked that her sisters were present throughout the story and that they came to try and help her and actively made sacrifices of their own to try and help her. I just thought it was a nice touch, given how often they're written out. It is kind of heartbreaking at that point where they say, oh, her sisters and her father were still watching over her. Well, it's the contrast of the different kinds of love, isn't it? Because she is loved. She's very deeply loved by her family. And I guess it's the idea of not recognising what you have. It ties into the slightly different reading as well, that the like the land, the human world is kind of a representation of adult life, whereas under the water is childhood. And it's kind of showing that even when she moves onto land, she still has the family ties and all of that is still there, which I think is reassuring for children. That's an interesting reading. That's the way I saw it, because that's why they could only come up with the water from a certain age. And the way they talked about it, where it's like, oh, it's it's kind of different. But then they kind of get used to it and it becomes boring to them after a while. I'm like, ah, oh, it's be like being an adult. You get freedom, but then you get bored. I actually really like that interpretation. Should we do it then? Should we talk about the ending? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Jeez. Look, it's broken. What What the most tragic thing about this story is when I read that the original ending he wrote was perfect. It was fine. And then he was like, oh, it's too sad. I'm going to change it. I'm like, no, he, he ruined it. Apparently, the original ending, he, she just turned to foam. It's the end of the story. That's how it should be. Yeah, I agree. I kind of agree, yeah. Well, we got three, three out of three on that one. We all agree. I do agree. I can see why he didn't want such a bleak, tragic ending and he wanted the possibility of hope. But also, I feel like it would have been better if he just committed to his choice. Yes. But I guess it's the idea of love ascending you as a higher being. Like if you're a kind, faithful person who acts well for others. It just doesn't resonate with the rest of the story. It doesn't. It's like, be good children, by the way, or the air spirits will suffer forever. It's like he suddenly remembered he was writing a fairy tale. <laughs> it just feels strange. Like, if we're talking about the very last paragraph where he says... Oh, children, be good. Be good all the mermaid spirits. It's just so cheap and clearly tacked on. It is. Like, you should, if you want that to be the point of your story, you should work it into the story. Like, if you compare with Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, the children in that story are horrible and are immediately punished. They got turned into giant blueberries or whatever. That's how you do it. You don't get to the end of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And they're like, oh, by the way, kids, every day you misbehave, Augustus Gloop has to spend another hour in the chocolate tube. Like, come on. <laughs> this new thing at the end feels like it comes out of nowhere and it doesn't fit with the rest of the story. It's so jarring. I mean, it's a very Christian redemption story. It could have been such a nice story about how you should take what you have, like, appreciate what you have and not take it for granted. Yes. And then it doesn't really work out because at the end you're like, well, it kind of almost worked out for her, I guess, so whatever. It just doesn't seem right. The ending in my heart is that she becomes foam, as sad as that makes me. Yeah, that is the better ending. That is actually what I thought the ending was before I read the actual story. I had to, what I did right was I read it and I was like, that can't be right. And I checked other sources to check that this wasn't some weird translation which had had a bit tacked on the end. But no, it was in Halloween. 
cool. Should we talk about the man behind the story, Hans Christian Andersen? Absolutely. A very strange guy. <laughs> As always. Right is always weird, aren't they? So he's from Denmark. Um, he was allegedly related to royalty, but a lot of people say that's nonsense. He went to school, but he was not the greatest student. Somebody got one of the kings to pay for his education, which I thought was interesting. I guess if you're a king, you can just be like, sure, I'll pay for your education. And it's like, it doesn't even matter because you're so rich. But we'll also talk about Charles Dickens because this is a great story. So Hans Christian Andersen was a big, big Charles Dickens fan. He met him and they started a tentative friendship, exchanged manuscripts, had a, had a few good times together. And then he told Charles Dickens, can I come visit your estate for a couple of weeks? No, he stayed five weeks and Charles Dickens thought he was a terrible house guest because he was upset that one of the family members wouldn't shave him in the morning, which seems weird. Wow. Apparently it was a Danish tradition that um, one of the young male members of the family would shave any guests and Hans Christian Andersen was upset that the Dickens family would not honour this tradition. So... <laughs> They arranged for a, like, a local barber to come do it, but he was not happy with that. Charles Dickens said that he didn't seem to speak English or French very well. found it quite difficult to understand him. He was a nuisance as a guest, I think. He left after five weeks. I don't think he wanted to go. I think in the account I read, he cried. Um, poor guy. Yeah, I read that he generally, while he was doing all this stuff, and Charles Dickens was like, I've, I've got to get rid of this guy, he was thinking. And then Christian Anderson is just like, I'm having a great time. I, I do pity him a bit. He seemed to have a trend of doing that. It makes me wonder why, but... Um... I guess he just wasn't very aware of himself. Apparently he had very strong emotions. That makes sense. Yeah. Like, apparently, the um, guy who partially inspired the Little Mermaid apparently tried to sabotage the guy's wedding when he got engaged. Wow. So if Hans Christian Andersen had been the story, he would have stabbed the guy then. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> anyway, at the end of his very long visit, um, I think Charles Dickens put a notice up somewhere that Hans Christian Andersen stayed in this room a very long time. Everyone was tired of him <laughs> or something. <laughs> and that was kind of the end of their friendship, which was quite sad for Hans Christian Andersen. Did he actually find out, do you know, if what he'd done wrong? Because I read it that like their, their relationship just kind of tapered off. I think it was the house stay that did it because he was only supposed to stay for two weeks and he stayed for five. Do you think he realised that that's what it was? No, probably not. If he didn't realise that everybody was actively annoyed with him while he was there. Well, I guess we don't know if it was Dickens that had the problem or if it was the rest of his family. So, apparently... When this guy, Edvard, called Anderson a worthy friend in 1836 on the year of his wedding, Anderson's response was, Why do you call me your worthy friend? I don't want to be worthy. That is the most insipid, boring word you could use. Any fool can be called worthy. I have hotter blood than you and half of Copenhagen. Edvard, I feel so infuriated by this loathsome weather. I also long for you to shake you, to see your hysterical laughter, to be able to walk away insulted and not come back home for you for two whole days. <laughs> that is quite the speech. I know, right? And this guy was engaged. Do you think he rehearsed it? Awkward. Well, it was a letter. Oh, a letter, okay. Then he would have had time to come. But you know that he was he was reading that stuff out while he was writing it. Yeah, absolutely. Because apparently, um, apparently in Colin in Edward's memoir, he said, "I found myself unable to respond to his respond to this love, and this caused you all for much suffering." So again, unrequited love. Yeah, Hans Christian Andersen had not a great love life. He had lots of unrequited loves, including Jenny Lind, who. You may recognise her name from The Greatest Showman. She was the opera singer that Barnum maybe ha considered having an affair with, which I thought was an interesting little snippet. But he did not he did not settle down with anybody. He did not find the one for him. A rarity amongst the authors we cover. I think he did feel love quite deeply. It just didn't pay off for him at any point. He would love to have a great love affair. He just seemed to pick the wrong people. 
All right, that's it for this week. Thanks for listening. As always, you can find all of our previous episodes and our stories on our website at theshortstoryworkshop.com. If you'd like to contact us, you can do so via Twitter. I am at Matt B. Writer, Mel. And Simone. T underscore M underscore typewriter, also known as the modern typewriter. Perfect. And of course, we'll be back with another story next week. Goodbye.